Good morning, church. Good morning, fam, friends, family. Uh, it really is, as always, a blessing and a privilege to be able to share uh, with y'all. And even in small conversations, and as well as being up here, being able to share uh, God's word. Um, so this morning, uh, as, as Stephen was saying, we're continuing our series on uh, the Jesus way. So if this is like your first time, uh, we're doing a whole year long uh, series on spiritual formation. Uh, what does it look like to become more like Jesus in our relationships, um, through our money and our sexuality? Um, and, and ultimately, it's three things that Brad has been mentioning again and again. What does it mean to remain in Jesus' love? What does it mean to reflect Jesus' likeness and repeat Jesus' lifestyle? So that's the last one is the one that we're camping out on this series. So we're going to be focusing in on essentially, what, how do we do what he did? And out of many things that Jesus did, uh, whether it was preach the gospel, heal the sick, uh, we'll take a look this morning at something simple, yet a very profound reality of how Jesus' love manifested itself with others when he shared meals with sinners. Now, I know not everyone in this room might not consider themselves Christian, uh, but just for a moment, when we think about Jesus sharing about the gospel, you might be hearing this phrase again and again. What comes to mind? Like, was Jesus yelling from an ancient, like, makeshift, you know, bullhorn made out of papyrus, like, telling people to repent? Uh, was he going around, passing around these ancient tracks, getting ready to give you the four spiritual laws, right? Or on the contrary, was he a revolutionary? Was he with John and James get ready to coup d'etat and overthrow the Roman Empire? Um, and yet, on the, contra on the contrary, we see Jesus preaching and sharing the good news of the kingdom through the means of sharing meals, sharing meals with others, eating food with others. A rather ordinary means to bring forth the extraordinary news of a new kingdom and its king. So when we consider the context of sharing meals, many things come to mind for each of us. I know we're in September and then I know Halloween is on the cusp, but it's like September, October, November, everything just goes by so quickly. We can think about the holidays like Thanksgiving and Christmas as an example, where for me, the kitchens get filled up with all the tias cooking, making tamales with banana leaves and drinking ponche, you know. And whatever your family customs are, you think about shared meals with others and how you experience that. And at the same time, for some of us here today, when we think about sharing meals with others, we begin to feel a sense of alienation, a sense of worry, feeling like we don't have a seat at the table, kind of like a protagonist in this movie where she feels that she can't find a place. So ultimately, she finds solace in a bathroom stall. I'm talking about mean girls, right? Like she can't even sit with nobody, so she sits in the bathroom stall. <laughs> and yet, in a different vein, for when it comes to sharing meals with others, we can find ourselves intentionally or unconsciously separating ourselves from others from a particular group because a deep resentment or hatred fueled by pain. Like my friend who spent 10 years behind California penitentiary, like he couldn't sit with certain people. So perhaps you identify with one or many of these examples today, but no matter where you find yourself, this morning I just want to say that Jesus is the unexpected guest that meets us for a shared meal. What does that look like? In that, he demonstrates his grace, that is his divine help towards us when he meets us where we're at. So if you, if you have a Bible or we have the scriptures up here, we're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 9, verses 9 to 13. As we continue today, today's sermon on a meal with sinners. Now, before going into the word, let me just open up in a word of prayer. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Holy Triune Godhead, we come before you acknowledging your presence, and we thank you for your word. We thank you for the scriptures that you have inspired uh, men thousands of years ago that we just put together. Now we get to read and, and digest, and I just pray for your spirit to just speak to our hearts. Good soil, in Jesus' name, 
Amen. Matthew 9, 9 to 13. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax office. And he said to him, follow me. And he got up and followed him. While he was reclining at the table in the house, many tax collectors and sinners came to eat with Jesus and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked the disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Now, when he heard this, he said, it is not those who are well who need a doctor, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I didn't come to call the righteous, but sinners. Now, we're jumping straight into uh, chapter 9, but previous to this, Jesus was already, essentially, he had just finished teaching the Sermon on the Mount. So Jesus has beginning, was beginning to grow his reputation of this holy man who heals a paralytic man, liberated, demonized people. And it is within this context that the local people start looking at Jesus as this righteous miracle worker, a holy man within the first century Palestine. So when we think about this story, we come across Matthew, which for some of us, if we've seen The Chosen, we have this figure of this very quirky character, right? Ta Matthew the tax collector. And it is Matthew who some scholars also believe was essentially a customs official. So Capernaum was at, at a port town where a lot of trade would go, come in and out of this town. And Matthew was the type of person to essentially tax all the stuff that was coming in, leaving the people under an unjust taxation, leaving them with this burden, this financial stress. So in this moment, Matthew is seen as the enemy. He's seen as a traitor. Uh, you could think, for all you Star Wars lover, like just imagine like people within the Republic and the Empire collaborators. Like who are these folk that are in a sense on the, on the wrong side of history? Or if you think about 1930s, 40s, how the French, some of the French felt towards their own Frenchmen who were collaborating with the Nazis. There was this tension between uh, Matthew the tax collector and his Jewish kinfolk. And yet, when we see Jesus come, step in, calls Matthew, we see there's an immediate response as Matthew had already known about Jesus, this holy man, and his call to follow him was a call to discipleship. And so as we, as we see here, so they follow him, and then in verse 10 it says that while he was reclining at the table in the house. So picture this, this is like a, essentially like a party. He comes through, Matthew tax collectors, everyone's posted up right there, and it says right there, tax collectors and sinners came to eat with Jesus and his disciples. Now, in this context, they're reclining. So it's, you picture this image of a bunch of people gathered, kind of laid around, sprawled around, just eating, having a good time in a sense. And it's in this context that the Pharisees come in and question, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Now, in this moment, at the heart of the question of the Pharisees is the question of holiness. If, teach, if Jesus really is this holy teacher, how does a holy teacher eat with sinners? Like, does he not know that they are sinners? Like, there's some incongruity, like something that doesn't make sense in this moment. And I think that this question in the minds of the Pharisees of holiness is a question that many of us today whether we've thought through or not, have at the forefront of our mind. What does it mean to be holy? Is this moral perfection? And, and how can we be among others if we're going to become ourselves unclean? So, and, and what's interesting is that in response to this question, Jesus says, it is not those who are well who need a doctor, but those who are sick. So, in this moment, Jesus flips the script on their view of holiness as he presents this analogy, analogy for us to consider today. For Jesus, holiness and uncleanness was akin to being sick and needed someone to heal you of your illness. And he says, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I didn't call the righteous but sinners. So in this moment, Jesus parallels sin and holiness with sickness and healing. And doing so, 
he is challenging the preconceived notion of the Pharisees of what it means to be a holy person in the midst of sinners. As, as I think about this, I think about what Brad mentioned a while ago when he was talking about what does it mean for us to serve and love others when we are to look and see others through the eyes of compassion and mercy versus eyes of disdain and separation. Now, now what's really cool about this is that Jesus is, is speaking compassion. He's talking about those who he's eating with. And in, in, the, same, and in the same breath, he challenges the Pharisees, kind of like saying, go and learn what this means. Y'all are the supposed scholars of our time. Y'all have studied so much and yet have missed the meaning of the scriptures. So Jesus rebuked to the Pharisees and meant to humble them, to remind them as he quotes uh, from Hosea 6.6, 6, where it says, For I desire mercy, not sacrifice, and acknowledgement of God, rather than burnt offerings. So in this moment, Jesus challenges the Pharisees in the sense in their knowledge, their extensive knowledge of the Old Testament, and he quotes a minor prophet. A minor prophet where in this context, you, you have the different tribes of Judah and Ephraim going against each other and forgetting about the stipulations of the covenant of Moses. So going back a little bit, Jesus is hearkening back to the Old Testament, saying, y'all have been focused so much on the letter and have missed the heart of the covenant. In other words, God calls Israel out of Egypt, and after the Exodus, God presents them with the Mosaic covenant. It was an act of grace, and it is this act of grace that the heart of the covenant was has said. It was a steadfast love. It was mercy. So in this moment, Jesus is saying, like, y'all have missed it. Y'all have gotten so stuck on the rituals and got so stuck on the religious uh, sacrifices that y'all have missed mercy. Now, in this moment, it is not that Jesus is doing away with sacrifice and just saying it's all mercy because it is the same compassion and mercy of God that would bring Jesus through the incarnation to live and die as a sacrifice for us. So there is a sacrifice element here, but in this moment, Jesus is challenging the Pharisees to remind them, y'all have missed the point. Y'all have missed the point of God's compassion and mercy. R.T. France summarizes this whole passage when he says, sinners who hunger and thirst for righteousness are closer to true righteousness than the self-satisfied. And it's really interesting because as we think about this story, we see Jesus eats with the tax collectors and sinners, and it makes the religious leaders upset. There's something wrong here that this holy teacher is eating with these sinners. And yet Jesus pushes back and explains that he came for those who are sinners. And what's interesting is that in a sense, it is the sinners and not the righteous who are blessed. So when we think about this story, I have a couple of points for y'all to consider, which is not nothing crazy or new, but God loves sinners. God loves sinners. Like this is something that it feels almost like we're taking for granted in a sense. And yet when we talk about this phrase, you sinners, whether you, wherever you find yourself, it might make you feel sort of uneasy or feel as if it's a loaded term that comes with a lot of baggage. Like maybe it's analogous to saying like, oh, you're a sinner. That means you don't fit a particular norm or mold of what it means to be a Christian. Maybe you got long hair. Maybe you got tattoos. Like that's, you're, you know, sin, I don't know. But yet we have to understand what the Bible says about holiness and sinners. Because just to remind you, the Pharisees were wrestling with this idea of how can this holy teacher eat with sinners? In other words, how does holiness and sin intermingle? Going back to the beginning of the scriptures, you see that God creates man and woman in his own image and likeness. And he gives them the cultural mandate to be fruitful and multiply and steward the earth and its creation. And yet, we see that there's this image of this serpent that steps in and deceives Eve and Adam and Eve essentially take of the fruit, allowing for sin to enter the world. And in this moment, 
we have to understand what sin is. Because a lot of times we think about sin and the thing that comes to mind, it's just moral bad stuff. It, sin is saying the wrong thing or stealing. And, and while all these things are true, there's a bigger picture of sin that I think Jesus refers to in this story. Now, I found this article from the Bible Project that I thought was super helpful. And it says here, to be created in the image of God like this suggests that humanity's most essential nature is divine love. Living with love for God and one another and all creation is our primary human goal. Choosing to not love invites corruption into the goodness of creation. So it is kata or sin. In other words, sin is failing to live out God's vision for humanity. There's a calling on each of us as image bearers in which God has called us towards a, a, a holy vision where we get to experience love for God and love for our neighbor. And yet, when we fail to love God, when we fail to love our neighbor, we are corrupting the world. And, and, and it's this sin that when Jesus says, it is not those who are well who need a doctor, but those who are sick, he sees in this moment sin as a disease. Sin as a disease that essentially just covers all of our, our world and our relationships around us. Now, when I say sin as a disease, this is not like abdicate moral responsibility. This is not mean that, oh, it's just, I can't, it's not my fault because it's, it's a disease, I can't really help it. But it's more so to paint a more holistic picture of what sin is rather than just thinking of moral bad stuff. So in response to this, we have this sin that is like a disease that has plagued humanity. And yet the question remains, how can a sinner approach a holy God? What is holiness? And it is this question that was super fascinating enough, like sitting in a seminary cohort and, and our beloved professor, Gary Bashirs asked this question. And if some of you may have met him, have seen him, he can be a very intimidating guy. So him asking the question is, leaves everybody on the edge of their seats, like who's going to be the first to respond? And sure enough, I'm pretty sure it was Brad. But it's like, it's just one of those moments that you just feel like, is this a trick question? What do you mean? And he brought up the story in Isaiah 6 where you have an image of, of Isaiah and, 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 and him coming, seeing this vision of, of the holy God and the seraphim and holy, holy, holy. And how can a sinner stand before a holy God? And yet the answer is yes. A sinner can stand in the presence of a holy God. As, as Gary Brashear says, his holiness, referring to God's holiness, is what motivates him to come to sin to bring healing. Sin cannot remain long in his presence without being affected. See, it's God's holiness. It is his, his unique characteristic of him being dedicated to his people that draws, us, draws him near to us. It is his holiness. Because I think at times, depending on a church tradition you may have been brought up in, holiness and love are pit against each other. As if it's a, 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 false, it's a false dichotomy. It's a, it's a holy love. It's a other type of love that God expresses when he dedicates himself to his people. So when we think about this holiness, it is the holiness of God that draws him to us. As we see in the story that Jesus is there with the tax collector and with the sinner, and we find other examples of this in the Gospel of Luke where uh, he meets a tax collector by the name of Zacchaeus. And he comes and he tells him, like, hey, get your house ready. I'm going to your, I'm going to your house right now. And Zacchaeus is like, yo, like, it's crazy. Like, I'm going to give back all the money I rob people of. And, you know? and then on the flip side, you see a woman that comes and just pours out her jar on Jesus' feet and just washes his feet. And in that moment, the Pharisees are looking at Jesus like, does he not know who that woman is? Does he not know what this woman has done? And yet Jesus is right when he stands before us. It's like, y'all didn't even say, y'all didn't even extend this notion of hospitality when I came in here. And yet G and this woman has come and showered my feet. There is this love that Jesus has for those who are on the outside margins. So when we think about this in this story, how Jesus eats and dines with tax collectors and sinners, we get to see 
a heart, a, a picture of the gospel, of the good news of God's love for sinners. God's love for sinners that we, we stop for a second to, 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 to remind ourselves and think like in this moment, it is his holy love that saves humanity from sin, from death and from judgment. It is a holy love that is dedicated to his image bearers and yearns for us to flourish. And, and this is just wild news. This is just wild news as this story is, is such a personal, near and dear story to my heart. As, as some of you know my story, uh, I had grown up in a Latino Pentecostal church for 12 years and ultimately there was just a bunch of legalism and a whole other th bunch of things that drove me away from church completely. Became atheist, I hated God, hated church for about 10 years. And, and slowly just through acts of kindness and mercy, for the first time, I had read my Bible. Would you imagine that? Hating a God that I had never even read about, right? And yet, in that, I came across this story, this picture where for some of us here today, or, for, or you might know someone, that you invite them to, to this gathering, like, oh, like, come through, you know, Sunday morning. And there's this tension of, like, why am I going to go to this Sunday gathering when I'm not a hypocrite? Like, I already know, like, I'm just, I'm a sinner. Like, I'm not going to go there and pretend like I, you know, that's not what it is. And for the longest time, I felt that. I felt that whenever someone invited me to a church gathering, I, was, I thought to myself, how am I, like, I'm a real one. I'm not going to go in there and pretend I, like I'm Christian, this, this, and that. I'd rather stay outside and just do my own thing, knowing that I'm going to continue sinning. And yet, coming across a story it is not those who are well who need a doctor, but those who are sick. You see, church gatherings are for the sick, are those who acknowledge there's something within us that we are in desperate need of God's love and God's grace. And it is that in which is the good news that Jesus has stepped into our world and, and, and taught us and, and, and died and rose from the grave and sent in his spirit so that we could find grace. We could have a relationship with the Father through the Spirit by means of the cross. So we think about this. The gospel spreads through shared meals and all are welcome. So we see a picture here of Jesus and, and, and he's, spread, he's sharing these meals with sinners and tax collectors. And yet there is no... There's no like separating in regards to like only you could come through, not you. In other words, these meals are for religious and irreligious alike. And, and that's good news because when we think about it in this picture, we have the tax collectors, we have the sinners. We also have Jesus' disciples. They're hanging around there too. This isn't like a specific group that could be marginalized. In other words, there's no spiritual hierarchy with Jesus. And that's exactly for those who feel weird stepping into a church gathering. Now, what's really cool when I, stepping back, thinking about this idea of sharing meals with others, it, it, it speaks into so many issues in our day-to-day -day life. One that is near and dear to me is the immigrant, this act of unity for the immigrant, for those who feel they don't have a home. And perhaps it doesn't even have to be, but for some of us who have come to the valley and it's just like, this is all new and fresh and dear. It's like, what does it mean when you don't feel that sense of belonging in home? And yet I really love what Alberto La Rosa Rojas says. He says, for all those who feel homeless, for all those who wander, table practices are an experience of welcome and adoption into God's household. On the other hand, for all those who fearfully grasp to secure and sustain their earthly homes, table practices offer an experience of both disruption and liberation. And what this means is that when you open up your home and invite the other in, you are extending an invitation, reminding them that they are a part of God's household. And yet at the same time, it safeguards your own heart where you, we could easily begin to kind of create our own little world, we're closing ourselves off from other brothers and sisters. So when we think about this, the power of sharing a meal with others is, is, is that it brings this theology, it brings this theory into real life. In other words, this isn't some Gnostic abstract stuff that we just talk about. 
but it's like a real thing that we can invite people to eat into our homes or go out to eat. And then in the same way, we're affirming God's good creation. That this is, and this is radical to think about that. It seems so simple, but yet we are affirming God's good creation and we get to participate in God's mission to welcome everyone to the table, whether you're Christian or not. So just as Jesus shared meals, we share meals too. In other words, just as I was saying from the beginning, this series is how do we do what Jesus did? As Jesus had meals with sinners and tax collectors and, and, and Matthew was called to respond and become a disciple, we too are called to do as he did. Even though, just as Jesus, we could be misunderstood. We could be seen as weird for eating with this person or doing that or engaging in whatever relationship. But yet, here we got to think for a second that in this moment, we've seen the story that God meets us where we're at and he comes to heal us of our sin. So how do we follow in Jesus' footsteps? How do we, 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 we see Jesus engaging and we see Jesus eating and yet how do we do this? So I would like to offer five points, which I know is like, oh, you know, just five points. Um, <laughs> that it's a mixture of, of, of live experiences and also some wisdom found in the scriptures. So how do we follow in Jesus' example? We become aware of our world and we practice hospitality. A lot of times we think, well, that's cool, that's, that's good and all, but I'm really busy, I don't really know. And yet we take a, a step back and consider, and, and it's easy. We think about coworkers going out on a, on a lunch, you know, during, you know, well, between work hours, right? But then also, just there's so many things that we get to think about. And, and here's one that, you know, I guess, I don't know, this is more of like a Latino thing maybe, but there's a phrase that says, el que invita paga which means whoever invites pays. So there's this like idea of like, yo, I'll invite you to lunch. That's you telling them, I'm going to cover your meal. So I feel like a lot of times as Christians, we can just easily forget about generosity. Like what does it look like to invite someone to a meal and vice versa? And, and this, could, this, this looks like many different things. Like it could be, you know, I have a friend, you know, he loves video games and he just meets a whole group of people like, traveling across the city who he's met just playing video games. Like there's certain ways you got to consider the world around you. Uh, it could be your local gym uh, or even if you're just at home with your, your kids going to a local park, ice cream, you know, just like little things, right? And uh, asking the spirit, God, like what is the world around me? How can I act and, and, and be hospitable to my neighbor? And and honestly, and if you've if you got that relationship, invite yourself over. I've done that multiple times where I've like, ta- I was talking to a good friend of mine and he's, I had met his friend and he was sharing his heart for cooking. I looked at him and I'm like, look, man, I'll put down the money you cook for me. How's that? And he was like, okay, cool. Invite yourself over. <laughs> Second point, become an intentional listener. I think this is so crucial for us. I feel like a lot of times as Christians, we just can't wait to tell you the right answers. We just can't wait to explain to you why your view and your worldview is so wrong. And let me just tell you, let me just explain this to you. And yeah, I found this book so, so helpful. It's called Listening Well by Dr. William Richard Miller. And he talks about empathic understanding, this idea that the ability to understand and, 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 and share the feelings of another is, is, allows us to listen well. He writes, willingness to see through another's eyes, to suspend self-centeredness, to receive respectfully what they have to offer, and to desire their well-being, these are habits of mind and heart that underlie and motivate empathic understanding. So there's this idea when we meet with someone that we can actually try to see what it's like to be in their shoes and actually kind of step outside of our own self, step outside of this desire where we just want to wait for the other person to finish talking so we could get our word in to actually listen and perhaps maybe even receive from what they have to say. And 
this really could stem in, in, in the form of just asking open-ended questions. A lot of times we ask specific questions, because, I, and I know I speak as someone that's been guilty of this, where I ask questions because I want to get to this point where I want to be able to share the gospel and get them to make a decision. And yet, when we think about the good news of Jesus, the gospel is not a, just a, a little ticket to, to go to heaven. Like the gospel is not just this thing that's going to get you out of fire. It's like a fire insurance car. Like the good news of Jesus is that God sent his son to live and die and raise from the grave, sent his spirit that we could be a people to bring forth his, his, his good news to a lost and dying world. And yet it is in the midst of relationships. Is it, it is in the midst of repetitive meals, sharing meals together, asking open-ended questions. And this is a big one, to not be distracted. And I say that because I got called out this week easily. You know, I just talked to someone, a song comes on, and then he's like, yo, you're not even paying attention. Oh, you know what? You're right. A lot of times we can be so distracted in our conversations. Another one is that we could provide affirmations, look for moments and spaces to affirm the other person, uh, whether it's a strength that you see, uh, an effort, you know, good intentions. I remember one time I was invited for one, by one of my best friends uh, to his birthday party, and uh, he's a phenomenal, like, photographer, and he's not a Christian, and he invited me to this group, and I come through, and it's a lot of, it's all his friends, you know, his best friends, and, and they're all into, like, the dark arts, all occultic, all, you know, I'm there, I'm chilling, I'm okay, cool, you know, and I'm sitting next to this guy, and we're chatting, and he's telling me about, you know, how he got into, you know, film and photography, and he asked me what I do, and I'm like, yeah, you know, I work as an engineer, but I'm also in seminary. And then he was like, oh, you know, like, you know. And I asked him, oh, can I see some of your photos? And he's like, you're not going to like it. Like, it's just not. And I'm like, it's cool, you know. Sure enough, shows me some photos. And yeah, inverted crosses, blood spattered everywhere. Cool. And I was able to at least look at it and be like, yo, that, but that's a dope portrait. Like, you were actually, like, that's legit talent. Like, being able to see, like, the strengths of others. Like, it's okay. And this is not flattery. This is not for us to try to weasel our way into, like, maybe they might listen to me. But it's also something about speaking to God's truth and the beauty in image bearers and just the beauty in image bearers. So how else do we do this? And I think this is something that I also see is to not neglect grace and compassion I think sometimes we get so hung up on the truth. We get so hung up on giving a defense. And, and I'm all, you know, I, apologetics was the big thing, right? We see this verse in, in 1 Peter 3.15, but we forget 16. It says, but in your hearts regard Christ the Lord as holy, ready at any time to give a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that's in you. Cool, awesome. But we forget 16. It says, yet yeah, do this with gentleness and reverence, keeping a clear conscience so that when you are accused, those who disparage your good conduct in Christ will not be put to shame. There's an element of this gentleness and reverence that we get to participate in. Just as Jesus, the gentle lovers of, lover of our soul, how can we express that to the person across from us as we're sharing a meal? Fourth point, don't neglect the scriptures. Now, when we talk about our relationships with the outside world, I think we tend to fall, just like everything else in life, right? Like a spectrum of two extremes. On one side, we have, in a sense, the legalist, the fundamentalist. The, we see this picture of the Pharisees where we're, we're very weary of the people that we hang with. We're very weary about that person because if we even so as much as breathe the same air, I'll start thinking that idea. You know, this is, we got to separate ourselves. And yet, I think a lot of us kind of, whether we've experienced legalism in the past and we're all kind of like, we know that's bad, we're good. We could also fall on the other side, which I myself admit I have a tendency to do where we feel so comfortable that we essentially, in a sense, kind of neglect to talk about Jesus. We, 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 whether that's a, a fear that we may have of, of being judged or seen oddly, 
or simply because we just don't want to be a buzzkill. Like, man, we're having a great time at this party. We don't got to, like, talk about, you know, Jesus. But it's the truth. It's, it's, it's this idea that on one side we have legalism, and on the other side, I, I like what Dietrich Bonhoeffer says, it's, it's cheap grace. It's cheap grace. He says, cheap grace is grace without discipleship. Grace without the cross, grace without Jesus Christ living and incarnate. So when we fail to re recall the scriptures, because at the same time, if we're not even spending time with the scriptures, what do we even have to offer the world? What can we really say? And yet when we sense, like we, we, we separate ourselves, we start feeling like, you know what, I'm good. I don't want to rock the boat. And, and, and what happens is at times is that we can grow callous. And this doesn't happen overnight. And the truth is, it's not like one day we just decide to be wayward and be like, you know what, I'm good. I'm just, I'll do the Christian thing on Sunday. I'm going to do my own thing Monday to Friday, Saturday. But yet it could also happen in seasons of suffering and seasons of loss and grief where we can begin to, in a sense, question God's goodness and his presence. And it is in those moments that we could kind of feel more comfortable just doing the things, you know, that everyone else is doing. And yet, I've been personally convicted about this thing in specific. And I was reminded, and it's, it's such a, and, and I submit this in all gentleness, truly, where it says in 1 Corinthians, like, if you think you are standing strong, be careful not to fall. The temptations in your life are no different from what others experience. And God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand when you are tempted. He will show you a way out so that you can endure. This is not to shame or guilt anyone and saying like, oh, y'all are not talking about Jesus. Y'all need to talk more about Jesus. But really just considering at times where we can swing from one side of the spectrum to the opposite, and yet we fail to see the piece of wisdom, of God's wisdom, and how if we truly like are seeking God's kingdom to share this kingdom and its good news with the people we eat with. Now, the last thing, which I think is, in a sense, at the heart of, of how we, we share, share meals with others, is ultimately it's, it's the Spirit of God. It's the Spirit of God that leads. Now, I say that, and, and when you hear that phrase, you might think many different things, where it's like, oh, I'll get a prophetic word in the midst of it, or I'll do this, I'll do that. And for myself, I've experienced it where I work in the engineering architectural world, and I've had the opportunity to work with a vast array of just unique individuals and, and different backgrounds. And, and I remember there was one time I met this young guy, uh, one of the most brilliant engineers that I have ever met. And right off the bat, we had lunch and I just went straight into it. We're talking about like apologetics and I'm trying to get him about the gospel and this, this and that. And to my surprise, he was a brilliant, well-read atheist like this guy had done his homework like he we were talking about predestination double predestination free will like stuff that I was like cool like we're going back and forth with this and yet what ended up happening is that it just created a wedge where he felt like every time he'd see, he'd see me he would just insult me for whatever thing for every little thing and, and a piece of me was just always like, get it, it started getting under my skin where I was like, man, this guy don't even know me. Like, you know, like I'm over here just getting all upset, just getting like getting challenged. And yet in that, the spirit of God began to just work and just like there's a way in which not everything has to become a debate. And so, you know, we would share meals together, invite them to food, X, Y, Z, start playing soccer together. And slowly our relationship developed. And ultimately, at the very end of my time at that company, uh, I had a kind of like going away thing at a local brewery. So we're there and I invited some friends from church. We're all hanging. And I remember that he approached me because it was one of those moments that he really saw. He had known that I was a Christian, but this was one of the first times I guess he's seen me in community. And he knew that I was in seminary. And he came up to me out of nowhere and he just looks at me and he goes, you're going to be a great pastor. And when he said that, like, it just was so weird to hear from him. And, and, and to be honest with you, like, me sharing that has nothing to do with me just trying to gas myself up. In reality, it was just a reminder of God's grace, of God's grace, God's spirit working in my life. Because at times we think 
that what it means for the Spirit to lead is this quick, I'm going to talk to this person, and they're going to make this prayer, and this is going to work, versus the slow process of character formation. It's the lo- slow process of becoming more Christ-like, of being able to love your neighbor even when he insults you, being able to lovingly humble yourself, you bite your tongue, and then pray for that person. And yet, when we think about the Spirit's leading, that's a promise for all believers. That's a promise for all of us sitting here today who maybe feeling like, yeah, like I just don't have the right words or I don't have the theological insight or I don't know all the Bible. And that's okay. Like you could still eat with another person. Like you could still invite them over. You could still listen to their story. You could still be a loving presence. As the Spirit leads, it manifests. He manifests His work in us through the fruits of the Spirit. So, as I've discussed these, these five points for us to consider and to look at as we engage with others through the practice of, of sharing meals, I do want to also acknowledge that there are, there are a couple, a few realities when engaging with others through shared meals because we can kind of step into this feeling empowered, excited, and it's, we have to understand that this is just a part of our daily rhythm. In other words, sometimes you will have those conversations and things are going to be like amazing. You know, this guy gave, gal gave himself their life to Christ. Awesome. But other times we're going to be disappointed. We're going to be disappointed by people. We're going to be hurt by people. We're going to be disturbed. We're going to be taken out of our, our comfort zone. We're going to be like, oh man, I really want to tell them to take off their shoes, but they're walking around. Like, there's going to be a lot of things that we're going to experience, right? It's, it's, that's the reality of having people over. And yet, and the reality is because it's true of us. It's true of us. The reality is that just as others can hurt us and disappoint us, we disappoint and hurt others. Now, I'm not saying this to justify sin and basically give you a license to treat people like trash. I'm not talking about that. It's just the simple reality that we live in between the already and the not yet. Christ has come. Christ has died. Christ has raised from the grave. And yet we're still in this broken, fallen world. And yet we get an opportunity to advance his kingdom by the meek means of sharing meals. So when we do what Jesus did... We get to experience grace in our lives. We get to, our eyes for our neighbors begin to widen. We don't see them so one-dimensional. We get to see them as image bearers, holistically. And we provide a space for people living on the outside. We get to provide a space for them to feel like they belong at the table. In closing in the story, we see how Jesus eats with sinners and tax collectors. And this was an outcome of his holy love towards those in need, towards those sinners in need of a doctor. And it is that holy love that led Jesus to the cross to to die on behalf of sinners, to provide forgiveness of sin, and then to raise from the grave, to send us his spirit as, as we are continuing to build out his kingdom until he comes again. Now, For many of us read this story, you've probably heard this story multiple times, and quite frankly, you feel jaded. You feel jaded with this talk of Jesus eating with sinners. That's cool. Like, what else is new, right? But we have to just, as, as I think about this, I'm reminded by what Jesus said to the church in Laodicea in Revelation. He said, look, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and we will share a meal together as friends. Now, you might have heard this verse in the context of evangelism, somebody on the street saying, hey, Jesus knocks at the door, would you answer? But in the context, Jesus is talking to the church. He's talking to those who are within the church already saying, hey, like I'm standing at the door and knocking. There's many of us here in the church that feel that jadedness, that feel like I at one point had that intimacy with Jesus. But now after just the waves of life crashing on me, I just feel super like I'm, I feel numb. But Jesus is still knocking saying, if you open the door, I'll come in and we will share a meal together as friends. And and for us, it could also be for, for people who feel like they don't fit the mold of a Christian. Like, I don't fit this tidy box of what it means to be a Christian. And yet, 
there's room at the table for you. There's room at the table for you. And also for, for those of us who don't see Jesus as that exciting or even to the point you kind of our arm's length we have this, this, essentially this deep pride within us that, you know what, I, I'm good. Like, I have everything that I want. I have everything that I need. What do I need a doctor for? I'm healthy. I would just plead just this morning to just consider, incline your ear, to, to really think about the, new, the good news of God's grace presented in the person of Jesus. So this morning, I'd like to invite the worship team back up as we sing a couple of songs and ultimately, it's this, we, we get to respond to Jesus' invitation to this shared meal by coming to the Lord's table in communion. And this is what's so interesting about the Lord's Supper is at times we just do it every weekend, week out, where it just becomes just another thing we do. And yet we don't realize that it is, is this opportunity to look forward to that moment where the Lamb is going to allow all his people to come together in the new heavens and the new earth and break bread together. It is a picture of the upcoming feast that's yet to come at the resurrection. So when we participate in the Lord's table, consider that, that just as Jesus dined with sinners and just as Jesus gave up his life broken on the cross, we get to rem remember that today, this morning, when we eat, when we eat of the bread and drink of the juice. Tim Chester says, what we call the Lord's Supper is a foretaste of the Lamb's Supper in Revelation 19. It's the beginning of the feast we eat with Jesus and his people in the new creation. We eat with God's people and we eat with the ascended Christ present through the Holy Spirit. It is such a beautiful picture of the triune God. Like step, like, and what's wild is that Jesus could have picked any form of food to be his body. He could have picked the most magnificent duck or magnificent steak, and yet he chose bread. It's that simple, humble nature of his character. He steps into our world, and then he invites us to participate. Let us pray. Father, we just thank you this morning for your word. We thank you that we are invited to eat at the table. And just for all those who feel like they don't got a place at the table, I just pray for them. Lord, you welcome strangers, sinners, those who feel on the margins. That is your holy love in action. I just pray that we would celebrate you, Lord, that your spirit would stir us up to be hospitable, to listen well, and to be bold, to share the good news that there is a Savior. Lord Jesus, we thank you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.